Again, my name is Alan Matthews, and I'm the Dean of the College of Human Ecology. It is my pleasure, again, to welcome you here tonight um, and to um, this annual um, lecture made possible by the Iskell Family Program for Leadership Development in Public Service. It's hard to believe, but this program is now in its 10th year and is certain to continue long into the future. Now, at the College of Human Ecology, we teach students to not just become experts in their fields, but to fundamentally connect the knowledge they gain on campus here with the potential to change communities here in Ithaca and most importantly, around the world for the better. We challenge you, all of you, to incorporate the research in your curriculum and to add, de add this research depth to your experience on campus. The pace of discovery and opportunities for rigorous study at Cornell are truly remarkable. You have such an opportunity in front of you. But our commitment to public service presents a truly unique additional measure for your success. We must translate the scholarly insights in the laboratories and in our social science labs to successful field work and turning that into practical solutions for our problems. That translation takes passion, determination, and vision based on inspirational leadership. Not only has this series of lectures been attended by now thousands of students, 45 students have participated in ISCL internship in the, inter excuse me, in the IS ISCL internship program intended to give students inspiration and direction in again translating their knowledge, idealism, and optimism into concrete action. Each year, the growing numbers who attend the ISCL Family Program lecture and the stories of the summer interns are a testament to the value of real world experiences in shaping the success of our uni university's outreach mission. It's no surprise that David Scort continuously says Cornell should be the land grant university to the world. At a moment like this, it would be tempting to remark, as we often do, that the time has flown in the ten first 10 years of this lecture since 2001. But that would be a mistake. Year in and year out, the Iskell family support of Cornell's commitment to public service has had a recognizable and timeless impact on the passion and enthusiasm for advancing public service that Jill and Ken Iskell have shared is a remarkable achievement and the true source of inspiration for this program. So let me all, all of us, please join me in thanking Ken and Jill. Ken, will you please stand? Now I would like to introduce John Eckenrode, the director of the, Bromfren, the newly formed Bromfenbrenner Center for Translational Research and professor of human development. His work focuses on early interventions for at-risk families, child maltreatment, and stress. From the beginning of the ISCL program, he has worked with the ISCL family and a planning committee to bring exciting speakers to campus, and more recently, to help develop the summer internship program I spoke about. So I wanted to thank John for his efforts in making this program a true success. Without his leadership, I can I say this very confidently, without his leadership, the lecture series started strong and remains an incredibly important part of our university's commitment to public service. So John, please take the podium. And again, thank you so much for leading leading this effort for 10 years now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Welcome, everyone. It's great to see everybody out tonight. Uh, I'm really honored to, be, um, to introduce our speaker tonight. And uh, I'm really pleased again, as, as the last uh, several years, to present this lecture in collaboration with the Entrepreneurship 
speaker series. So I want to thank John Jaquette of the Entrepreneurship Program and Pedro Perez for so graciously sharing the stage with this program tonight. I hope, I'm sure you'll enjoy our speaker this evening. I would also like to thank uh, my amazing assistant, Patty Thayer, and the college's <clears throat> events coordinator, Diana Brinkman, for all the behind the scenes work that they did to make this uh, event possible today. So let's give them an applause. <clears throat> But really, a special thanks goes out to Ken and Joe Iskell um, uh, for endowing this program. It's really through your vision uh, that this program has been made possible, and it's a real treat that you're here tonight, as well as your daughter, Kiva, who's also a Cornell alum. It's so nice to have her on campus again as well. Uh, we've reserved, actually, a little time since it's the 10th anniversary, so much of what we talk about is looking ahead and thinking about the future, but since we've done this for 10 years, we'll spend a little time tonight looking backward, as, and, and for those of you who haven't been at previous uh, incarnations of this program, to reflect a little bit on what we've done. And in, in that spirit, I'll ask, after our speaker tonight, I'll ask Jill to come up and spend just a couple minutes so you get to meet Jill a little bit and see what a special person she is. And she'll just have a few words for us after Josh's uh, uh, speak, uh, talk tonight. Now, in a moment, I'll introduce our guest speaker. But as Alan mentioned, and I, I've said, this is 10 years. And I thought uh, we have a little, uh, little treat for you. We put together a very brief video. And, and I, I promise it's brief. I won't take much time. But a little bit of retrospective uh, to show you uh, some of the previous speakers and what we've tried to do with this program. We don't have time to review the entire history, so it's little snippets. But just to give you a flavor of the kind of people we've been able to bring to Cornell with the help of, of the Iskell family. And, so, uh, and this will give you a little idea of what will be coming in future years as well. So uh, we partnered with uh, local uh, filmmakers, Ann Michelle and Phil Wild, who put this together. So I thank Ann and Phil. And if with that, let's roll the video, and then I'll come back and introduce our speaker. We were exposed to wonderful, wonderful young people doing not-for-profit work in communities around this country. And it was the late 90s, and they inspired me because they were brilliant and creative and talented and skilled, and they could have done anything with their lives. And what they chose to do was to de dedicate themselves to, to service. And so out of that came this particular program. I've shared today with you some flashbacks of my own journey, and what I now know is a pilgrimage of resistance. In a society that mythologizes the individual, that in practice confers an aura of sanctity on the wealthy, it is an act of resistance to choose the path of humanity. I mean, we, we opened with 13 kids. It was a combined fifth and sixth grade group. I mean, we started really small. We were doing everything. You know, I was teacher. I was principal, I was phys ed instructor, um, you know, my brother was development director, he was fundraiser, he was cook, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was insanity. And so I decided that if I was gonna understand child labor, like as much as you can understand it, if in my case, again, you grew up in the suburbs here in North America, well then I wanna actually see it with my own eyes. And so when I was 12, I got this idea that I wanted to go traveling through Asia. We say people need to have power in markets and power in politics. So we provide health insurance, disability, life insurance. We're about to provide retirement. I saw firsthand how the children who everyone said, you can't do that with these kids. There's just too many things stacked against them. And how much the, the adult pushing them teaching them the character skills, teaching them the work ethic, and just putting the sweat equity into it, what it produced. Cornell ushered in a new spirit in American higher education. The commitment not only to produce learned and thoughtful students, but to produce useful and public-spirited citizens as well. And the Iskall Family Program for Leadership Development in Public Service nobly and generously carries on Cornell's founding vision. 
This is what it says inside the Eddy Street Gate. So enter that daily thou mayest become more learned and thoughtful. So depart that daily thou mayest become more useful to thy country and to mankind. Well, I hope that gives you just a little idea of, of the excitement that these uh, lectures have generated over the years. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker for the evening. Tonight, we have a very special guest, Josh Tetrick. Josh is a 2004 alumnus of Cornell. He's been a Fulbright scholar teaching street children in Nigeria and South Africa. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan Law School. And he's done many things in his, 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 what seems to be a short career, but he's done a lot of things, and I'm sure he'll do a lot more in the years to come. He's led a UN business initiative in Kenya. He's worked with former President Bill Clinton. He's worked with the president of Liberia to reform that country's investment laws. He's also worked in the private sector on sustainability and climate change strategies. Josh is now the founder of 33 Needs, an investment platform that connects social entrepreneurs with micro-investors. I learned a new word in this process, crowdfunding. And there was a New York Times piece today, actually, if you saw the Times op-ed section, there was a piece about uh, this phenomena in the Times today, so you might take a look. This gives small investors, like you and me, a way to form teams and groups to invest in socially worthwhile causes at the local level or internationally. So it's a thrill to have Josh with us here tonight. So without further ado, let's please join and welcome Josh back to Cornell. Oh, the memories of this place. I left here in 2004, and I have a lot of memories, but the memories that I like to focus on are the memories that people who study all this stuff called flashbulb memories. See, these are those memories that stay with us, whether they're good or bad. We can't get them out of our minds. These memories that are exceptionally vivid and detailed. When I think back to my time here, it's hard not to identify three or four of them. One was when I had the opportunity to listen to President Bill Clinton give our commencement address in 2004 and say a few words to him afterwards. At the time, my friend was standing next to me and she knew it was a big moment in my life to be able to have this brief conversation with President Clinton. And tears were just streaming down her eyes. And I remember uh, President Clinton looked at me and then he sent something was going on with her, and he looked at her and saw all these tears running down her eyes. And then he looked right back at me. Memories that have to do with the dance party that we had my second day on the third floor of Cascadilla Hall. See, I can't really dance much, so it was particularly embarrassing for me because all these people I had just met for the first time, and I was making a fool of myself, so it's almost impossible to forget that. Memories of that time at the chapter house that I was trying to convince this girl that we really need to be in a relationship. And she said, I don't think we really need to be in a relationship. <laughs> That's kind of hard to forget. And I told her that I was going to mention her today in the speech. And she said, uh, maybe you shouldn't. But I went ahead and did it anyway. She'll probably, smile. She'll probably smile when she hears this. Memories, those flashbulb moments. But I think the one flashbulb moment, that one flashbulb memory that sticks with me more than any other is a conversation I had with my friends. My friends and I, every single night, used to hang out on the third floor of Cascadilla Hall. Any Cascadillans here? Anyone live in Cascadilla Hall? Anyone on the third floor of Cascadilla Hall? Maybe. There you go. Represent Cascadilla. So every night, my friends and I used to talk about everything. We'd talk about politics. We'd talk about the run-up to the war in Iraq that time. We would talk about drama and TV shows and personal issues that we were having. Every night, we would go there and talk with one another. But one night in particular, we decided to get extra deep. We decided to go on all Oprah on each other. And we talked about who we are, who we are in the deepest possible way, who we are and who we want to be. 
and it was a long, important conversation, and I remember the faces of all the people that were there. I remember Tony, and I remember Lauren. I remember Mike and Dana and Amit and Jill, and we sat there talking with one another. But I remember during the conversation, I was confused because I didn't feel like I fit in to what we were talking about. Because we were talking about what we want to do when we leave here. And I had a set of friends during this conversation on the left-hand side that wanted to work at the big investment banks like Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, the consulting firms like Bain and McKinsey, big accounting firms, the big five. They were all about making as much money as quickly as possible, and they didn't apologize for their interest in doing so. And I respected that to some extent. And on the other side, we had my friends that kind of looked at those people like, uh, you don't get it. My friends who said, I care about deeper things than just pocketing another $100 bill. I care about things like inequality. I care about things like women's trafficking. I care about things like the fact that 67 million kids are denied a right to education every single day. That's my focus. That's what I care about. That's what gets me up at night. And I don't mind giving my life away to support those things. I don't mind sacrificing things that I care about, financially, in terms of relationships, to dedicate myself to a cause that's greater than myself. And I respected that group too, but I didn't fit in into either, into the group that wanted the Goldman Sachses, into the group that just cared about helping a kid get another piece of food. I didn't connect. And I was disturbed by it, honestly. I didn't have any clarity. I had no idea what I was going to do. See, back in the day, I had this far-fetched dream that I was going to play in the National Football League. In high school, I told everyone, you better watch out. I'm going to be a linebacker for the Philadelphia Eagles. You better get my autograph right now because it's going to be worth something one day. I didn't care about school. All I cared about was being a better football player. So the confusion in terms of what I want to do, has been with me for a while. But you might sit there and you might think, well, maybe I relate to the group on the left, or I relate to the group on the right, or maybe I relate to you, Josh, or maybe you relate to that old Josh that wanted to play in the NFL. I don't know. But this confusion among young people, trust me when I say this, is not a 21st century thing. It's been the case for years and years and years. Young people have always been clueless about what they want to do. We make it up, don't we? When we're at bars and we're out with our friends, when we meet granny for family reunions, and they say, what do you want to do? We give them an answer, but we don't really know if that's what we want to do. We're confused, and you guys know it. And there was this young man back in the day who had an opportunity, a rare opportunity, to stand in front of the guy who invented the light bulb, Thomas Edison, and ask Edison two simple questions. Two questions to give this young man one thing, one thing that I wanted so badly and one thing I bet y'all want, clarity. Clarity about the next steps you should take in your life. Clarity about where to throw your energy and your talents and your strengths. First question was this, Mr. Edison, I must know. You spent so much time and so much energy, so many resources into inventing the light bulb. Why? Question number two, and I love this one. Mr. Edison, I got to know, how do you thrive? And I absolutely love that word, thrive. Because thriving to me, guys, isn't just about pocketing 100 bucks. Thriving to me isn't just about being a good dad or brother. Thriving to me encompasses the whole deal, the whole spectrum in living an integrated life. Mr. Edison, how do you you thrive. And boy, Edison didn't hesitate when he told the young kid to get a pen and write this one down. Because he said, this is how I thrive, and this is why I decided to invent the light bulb. I open up my eyes. I find out what the world needs. And then I proceed to invent. And of course, the young kid didn't write it down. Edison repeated it. He said, young man, I told you, you better write this down, because this concept this mindset should guide the next 10, 20, 30 years of your life. Open up your eyes. Find out what the world needs. 
and then proceed to throw your life, your energies, your passions, your strengths, your skills into solving what the world needs the most. And today as a Cornell family, as a community, as a group of young people that care about living a life of purpose, as a group of young people who might be a little bit confused about what you want to do, it's really important to do two things. Number one, recognize the truth of who you are. And even more important, recognize the truth of what is out there. So for a brief moment, let's talk about out there. Let's talk about a world of 6.7 billion people and 1 billion people who live under $2 a day. A world of 6.8 billion people and 2 billion people who live under $2 a day. 67 million kids every single day around the world live under cardboard boxes. 67 million people, kids, live under cardboard boxes, addicted to drugs, lacking the opportunity to raise their hand in a classroom just like this one, mostly girls. 20,000 kids die of four things every single day. Count them off with me. TB, AIDS, malaria, and conditions related to not having one clean glass of water to drink in their entire life, a condition that affects one billion people every single day. It keeps going. Follow it. Two and a half billion people live in a state called energy poverty, a state without light or heat or transportation of any kind. A billion people go to bed hungry every single night if we have the courage to truly open up our eyes and find out what the world really needs, and if we have the courage to find out what the world needs, and we're being honest, we know these needs are not just a human thing, right? Because we live in a big planet, and we're not the only inhabitants of this planet. So let's think deeper. Let's think broader about these needs. Every second, a football-sized field of rainforest is just ripped up and thrown into the back of a flatbed truck. Every single day, 70 million tons of CO2 pollution dumped in our atmosphere like it's a smeltering, stank, open sewer, not an atmosphere we all should respect. Every day, scientists at universities just like this one call out to us and say we're facing something called the sixth extinction, a phenomenon that says by 2050, 50% of all the plants and the animal species on this planet just gone because of the havoc that we are wreaking on our global environment. And every day, every single day, an issue we certainly don't think about nearly enough, 70 billion animals live behind the walls of factory farms, suffering from cruel and inhumane punishment because of our simple choices about what we decide to have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now guys, we can hear these needs and we can do like I did for so long in my life, and we can close our eyes to them. We can pretend they don't exist. We can run around here being a bunch of apathetic young people. We can hear these needs and say, well, forget about apathy. Let me get all upset about it. Let me express a lot of anger and frustration and complain about it with my friends and family and rail against society because we live in such a world. I want to encourage all y'all tonight beginning when you leave, to choose option number three. Option number three is called thriving. Because solving what the world needs the most enables you to do just that. The world's biggest needs align with opportunities for you to thrive. For you to engage whoever you are. You're sitting there and you love finance, or design, or art, or music. You're sitting in there and there's something about consulting that just fascinates you. You're sitting there and you're a mathematics whiz. You're back there and you're thinking about how to code that next line of code for your computer science project. Solving the world's biggest needs align with all these skills, all of these disciplines, and it's up to you to find how it aligns with you because I promise it does. This is not about being a martyr to the world. This is about finding opportunities for you to make money, for you to have a prosperous career, for you to have the type of life that you want to have. Listen, I know it's a paradox, but it's also a fact. Selflessness, in many, many ways, can be profitable. Now I began this journey, this journey of confusion, this journey of clarity to see if I could find this alignment in myself. On the streets of Cape Town, South Africa, I was there working with a school called Learn to Live. Learn to Live is a school that does one thing. It educates street children. Now, if you've never heard that term before, street children, 
It's an actual official UN term for the millions of kids that live on our world streets. So if you're from New York or Philly or LA, some other big cities, you've seen lots of homeless people. Well, they're not homeless people, they're homeless kids. Seven, 10, 13 years old, lots of them hopped up on their drug of choice, shoe glue. See a little indentation in their shirt and they'll stand on the corner putting their nose down like this and huffing up. Some of them have big glassy eyes. It was my job to work at the school go out into their communities, the township of South Africa, Kailicha, but also to stand in front of them as their teacher and teach them basic things, math and history, the multiplication tables one time. So here I am, you know, guy that thought he was gonna play in the NFL, had this crazy dream, and now I'm in South Africa sitting in front of all these street kids teaching this lesson on the multiplication tables, still not knowing if this is what I really wanna do. But I remember being up, I had this tiny little piece of chalk in my hand, this old rickety chalkboard, and I went up and I started teaching. Seven times five, six times five, this is how it goes. But shortly after I started teaching, I saw a couple kids sleeping, I saw a few kids shaking their head like, oh man, I don't get what you're saying, doesn't make any sense. And then hands started coming up, I don't get it, Josh, I'm sorry, I just don't get it, I don't get it, I don't get it. And there was like a domino of, I don't get it, I don't get it across the room. Now, one young girl in the front row, see, she was particularly incensed by my teaching style. She was shaking her head. I mean, she, was, she looked like I had just stolen something from her. And I said, you know, I don't, I don't really know what to do. And she said, I got an idea. Let me try. I was out of options, guys. So I gave the chalk to her, and I said, you might as well get up there because I'm not doing a good job. And without even hesitating, this is what I love about this young girl, she took the piece of chalk from me, and she said, all right, sounds good. And I sat down, and she stood up. And I just love that visual of this white American man standing, sitting down as this young black South African girl stands up for her education. And she gets in front of her merry band of street kids, and she tries to teach them multiplication tables. And for the first couple minutes, it looked like they were listening to her. And then she starts to integrate these examples from the street into the lesson. She talks about this old, cold train platform where all the kids would sleep at night and tries to weave it and integrate it into the lesson as a way to communicate it more effectively. Now, I would love to end this story by saying, and all the kids got A's and they totally understood what she was saying, and then she took over and became a teacher for the rest of her life. I honestly don't know if the kids actually understood what she was saying, but I know I was awfully impressed. I was very impressed by her audacity to sit me down, her creativity to use that example from the street in her lesson. So after the lesson was over, I went up to her and I asked her a few questions. I said, what's your name again? Lauren, how old are you? I'm 12 years old, she says confidently. I said, well, you mentioned this old train platform that all the kids sleep on. Well, is that where you sleep at night? And she kind of laughed and she was like, no, come on, I don't sleep on an old cold train platform. You must be kidding me. I just sat you down and stood up. You think I'm going to sleep on an old cold train platform? I said, well, I don't get it. Where do you sleep then? If all the other street kids sleep there, you have a mom or a dad you can go to, a grandma whose home you can sleep at? And she said, no, sadly, all of them died. All of them died of AIDS. And I said, okay. So where do you go at night, Lauren? And she said, well, you know, what I usually do is hang out with European tourists, Josh. I was like, okay. I mean, I didn't even hang out with European tourists. This young girl's hanging out with European tourists. So I said, what exactly does that mean, Lauren? And she said, well, usually this is how it goes. Um, see all these European tourists, men, they hang out at the bars and the clubs on Clue Street and Long Street in Cape Town. And they come pouring out the bars at 1.32 a.m. And I just stand there like this, patiently waiting for them. And they come up to me. I don't need to come up to them. And they ask me a few questions just like you asked me, Josh. They say, uh, little girl, what's your name? Lauren. Uh, how old are you? Twelve. And then they ask this one. How much are you? And her answer is usually about the equivalent of five American dollars. So this young girl with such fire inside her is being abused and mistreated in the most sadistic and horrific ways by these men back in their hotel rooms, all because she wants a little food in her stomach 
and because she's too proud to sleep on that dirty train platform. And y'all, we can hear a story like that. And we can close our eyes and pretend it doesn't exist when we go on in our world, in our courses, in our friends, in our frats, in our sororities, in our student organizations. We can hear a story like that and we can get incensed and angry and pissed off that it happens. Or we can pick the better choice and we can thrive. We can thrive by starting and working with companies like Hello Rewind, a small company in New York City that said, how can I make a difference in the lives of women who have been victims of sex trafficking? Here's an idea. Let me take a t-shirt, turn it into a laptop slipcover, sell it for 50 bucks, and enable the women who have been victims of sex trafficking to take, sex trafficking to take part in the production process in the design process. You can check them out at hellorewind.com. We can be apathetic, we can whine or complain, or we can thrive by working with nonprofit organizations like More Than Me. An organization started by my good friend Katie who is sick and tired of seeing little girls on the street in Liberia and literally with just flat out tenacity started an organization with little education and is now educating hundreds of young girls in Liberia and making a salary for herself at the same time. We can thrive by working with companies, entrepreneurs with companies, called Better World Books. A company, it's a for-profit social enterprise. They're solving a need through being a better business. They sell textbooks, you might have bought some of them, and they give a percentage of the profits to help fight global illiteracy. You love fashion, you might say in the back. Work with, start a company like Eden, E-D-U-N, started by Bono and Bono's wife, Allie Hewson. It's this fashion company, the highest style fashion you've ever seen, and I certainly don't know fashion, but my friend told me it's very high fashion. And they enable women, similarly to Hello Rewind, to take part in the production process, to be a part of the design. They give women a fair wage. They make trade truly fair. For Africa, we find out what the world needs, and we thrive. It ain't be, and it's not about being a martyr. The journey continues for me. I'm trying to discover if I can align who I am with what the world needs and build a life that I'm proud of. It took me to Monrovia, Liberia. Who here has seen the movie Blood Diamond? Lots, lots of people, there you go. So if you just sort of close your eyes and you think about some of those scenes in the movie, that was Liberia. And that is Liberia. It's the third poorest country on the planet, a place that's been racked by civil war over the last two decades. You walk around the streets, and sadly, you see people with amputated arms and amputated legs. But I was there working with the president of Liberia, the president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, on investment law reform. And I certainly was not prepared for it. I had no business at the time working on investment law reform, but I was lucky enough to get the position. One night, I was working out of this hotel doing a little bit of research for my job. And I realized around 11.30 at night that I was actually supposed to have a meeting with my friend Katie. So I closed up my laptop, I put it in my bag, I jammed out the front doors of Royal Hotel, and I ran across this street called Sinkor Street. Now this is the main throughway in Liberia, in Monrovia, Liberia. Here I am with a backpack on me, running across the street. I'm almost to the edge of the street, and unfortunately for me, boom, I fall in a hole. Now, granted, I am extremely clumsy. There's no doubt about that. But I fell in a hole for two reasons. Number one, there were no street lights, and I couldn't see the hole. And number two, listen, Liberia has been engulfed in a war. There are huge potholes all over these streets where tank shells had landed in years past. So here I am, I fell in the hole, and Again, unfortunately for me, this nail gashed the side of my leg right here, and you can feel free to look at the scar when we're hanging out after this. Blood's coming out all over the place. It's into my sock. It's just, it's nasty business. Before I knew it, these two Liberian guys pick me up out of the hole. They throw me out of the street, and they look at me like, man, crazy white boy. You got to learn how to walk straight in Liberia, man. <laughs> God. And meanwhile, I'm looking at the blood just coming out of my leg, wondering, what do I do next? I call my friend Katie. I say, Katie, I fell in a hole. Blood's all over the place. She comes on her little motorbike, and she picks me up, and I hop on, and she takes me to this hospital called John F. Kennedy Hospital. Now, that might give you some reassurance 
that the hospital is called John F. Kennedy Hospital. Turns out it's the worst hospital in Liberia. <laughs> I walk up, the doctor looks at my leg, and he gives me this confused sort of look as he's looking at the blood just come out of my leg and this gash and probably uh, pieces of the iron nail all over my shin. And that really gave me anxiety, to be real with you guys, because you don't want a doctor in Liberia who's seen the worst sorts of Civil War atrocities looking at your leg like he's confused. <laughs> That's a problem. So um, I said, doctor, can I sit down and just wait for you guys to get to me? He was like, fine. And I noticed when I was sitting down, there was this little kid, must have been like seven years old. He was, he was sitting in a chair, and he was kind of leaning like this. His eyes were barely open. There were a handful of people on stretchers. I couldn't tell, honestly, if they were dead or if they were alive. There was this palpable sense of suffering I felt in the hospital. And when I say hospital, you know, JFK Hospital was, you know, maybe draw a line from here out to the third row and then draw a line there, and then you got your hospital. So the doctor came to me and I said, doctor, you know, before you look at my leg, you got to tell me what's going on with the people over there. What's going on with everyone around me? And he said, son, I'll be happy to tell you. We have three girls over there that got bit by a mosquito. And see, when you get bit by a mosquito in Liberia, unlike itching if you live in the U.S., sometimes you simply die. Got two little girls with AIDS, seven people with tuberculosis, and one person over there that drank a gulp of dirty water. And see, when you drink gulps of dirty water in the developing world, you're infected with a severe diarrheal disease that tends to dehydrate you and often it causes death. But again... We as young people, as Cornelians, as a community, do not hear that story and close our eyes to it. And we do not hear that story in whining complain. We hear that story and we find opportunities to thrive. Because we can thrive by working with organizations like One World Health International. A nonprofit, an innovative nonprofit started by a woman who said, I am sick and tired of so much money going into drugs like that deal with issues like impotence in the developing world, in the developed world, can't we spend a little bit more time, a little bit more energy dealing with the malarias and the TBs and the AIDS and the HIVs? We can thrive by working with companies, a for-profit company called Vestergaard. They manufacture products that help improve the global health of poor people all around the world. They manufacture an insecticide-treated bed net. They manufacture water filtration devices. We can thrive by working with companies, by starting companies like Aravind Eye Care, a huge company in India that treats millions of people that are near blind, millions of people that have glaucoma or cataracts. We can thrive, chemical engineers out there, people who love biology, by working and thriving with companies like Amherst Technologies who are re-engineering the mosquito to find a vaccine to help the poorest amongst us. This is not a story, y'all, about being a martyr. Don't think you're all special because, I, because you decide to do something good, because it's good for your life. This is a way for you to personally thrive. And the story continues. And it continues just a week ago. I had the opportunity to meet with a, a new friend of mine named Ethan Brown. Ethan Brown used to be the business development lead for a fuel cell technology company. He used to be obsessed with clean energy, Ethan Brown. You know, he realized about two years ago that he wasn't quite living his passion. See, Ethan's passion happens to be animals. See, Ethan recognizes that some of the food choices that we make every single day have ramifications for the environment, have ramifications for our health, also, there are a lot of issues associated with the way that animals are treated. To Ethan, when he looked out at the world, he saw mama pigs in small crates so small they couldn't turn around, and egg-laying hens in these tiny little battery cages so small they couldn't flap their wings, and it bothered him. It bothered his soul. So he left the company and said, can I invent, can I create something as an entrepreneur that helps people move away from supporting that stuff but provides them equivalent or better nutrition. He started a company called Savage River Farms. It's all about plant-based protein that he hopes will taste exactly like all the meat that we eat every single day. But the interesting thing about Ethan, he's a high-tech guy. 
he found this Chinese food scientist. And he connected the Chinese food scientist with this institute at the University of Missouri that is specializing in a particular type of technology that can turn plants into food that tastes exactly like meat. He got them together, worked diligently on that partnership for six to 12 months. And just recently, he was funded by one of the largest venture capital firms in the world, Kleiner Perkins. And just this week, he began raising his Series B round, which is sort of the round of investment where you start to accelerate and grow even more. We find out what the world needs, and then we proceed to invent. We open up our eyes and we scan the landscape. We scan the landscape of what's out there. We scan the landscape of ourselves, being honest about what drives us, what motivates us, what causes us, causes us to get up in the morning. Think about what you would do if you had a billion dollars. What job would you pay to do? What are those activities during the day related to school or related to an internship that you had that you would stop time and make a note and say, this is something that I enjoy doing. This is me. Let me leave you with, with two things. Two big mistakes that I think you can make. The first is this. Not getting that this is not a story about being a martyr. This is a story about you personally thriving. And the second big mistake I think you can make is this. Not going far enough. Because we live in a world, y'all, with lots of needs. Lots of needs in our community, and our nation, and around the world. And we, as a planet, cannot afford a passionate, intelligent group of young people to take an apathetic pass and sit on the sidelines. We need young people on fire. We need young people on fire for the world, and you need to be on fire for yourself. I want you to get in contact with me any time of the day, night. I would love to do anything I can to help connect you and find ways to connect you with what the world needs the most. That's what means a lot to me. It's been such an honor to be here. I can't thank Y'all enough for making this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, at this time, what I'd like, we're going to have some time uh, uh, for Q&A. But first, I want to invite Jill to come up and uh, say a few words. And then we'll bring Pedro up, back up on the, Pedro Perez back up on the stage, and he'll moderate the Q&A session with Josh. And I'm sure Josh will be glad to answer your questions. But first, Jill. Jill, please. <laughs> Josh and, and, um, and John Eckenrode, who's been a guiding light for this program, and Jan Conrad, who's been an angel, and my family, and um, Alan, and the rest of the team who helped put this together every single year. I'm very, very proud of it. Um, Josh, I, I, I want to I tell you all that this program was born, as, as I said, and some of you might have heard um, at the podium, I guess, 10 years ago, from my experience working with Al Gore on something that was called the Family Reunion Conference. It was at the end of the 90s. All of the kids I knew who were going to college were looking to make a gazillion dollars. And I, through the Family Reunion program, as well as through the work that Kenny and I supported, was meeting we were meeting just the most extraordinarily talented, gifted people who were saying, I think I want to do something that really will make me feel good as a human being in the world and make a difference to others. And so over the next 10 years, we kept meeting more and more and more of those people. And Josh has referred to many of them um, in one way or another, and he is among them. And all those who preceded Josh speaking at 
this um, annual gathering um, led me to want to write about all of these people, um, not necessarily the specific ones who were here already, but new people who are in this field. I feel like we have lived in sort of a time of economic collapse when people are looking at our political leadership and saying, where is our political leadership? And feeling pessimistic about our kind of feckless institutions and, uh, and the lack of, of leadership all over. And I find it, I find it in people who are doing work like Josh and the people who have preceded Josh here, here at, the, um, at Cornell and the people we interviewed for a book which we wrote. And, and I look at all of you and I've spoken to students who have done internships and I wanna say that the, the thread that ties those who in one way or another, and it doesn't have to mean that you have to do work in the slums of Nairobi, it can mean that you become a lawyer and start a pro bono arm of a law firm that you do. But I think that the, what ties everybody together who's out there is a profound reverence and respect for the dignity of every life on this planet. And, and that, that respect has come, it, it, we knew when I was growing up that there were people who were suffering in the world but we didn't have the immediacy of it, so we could sort of tuck it away and, and not necessarily deal with it. But you're, you're all just assaulted with it every single day, and, and you feel it. I mean, you showing up here tonight, and I know that you showing up here tonight is more than just because, oh, I have to believe it is, your professors told you you have to. Um, many of you, I think, will be the future global citizens of the world. And I am just very, very grateful to all of you for showing up. I'm grateful to Josh. I'm grateful to everybody who's had anything to do with this program. And I'd love for you to take the opportunity when you feel moved to do so, to join a conversation in a community that we're all trying to build. You can visit the website of the book that I wrote with my co-author, Peter Cookson, who's right there. And it's www.heartsonfire.com book.com and become a um, fan on Facebook, Twitter, but with a, little luck, with a little luck, we'll start to connect the dots and all of us together can have a huge impact on improving the quality of life for others all over the globe. And I thank you very, very much and I thank my husband for making all my dreams possible. What makes you, as a person, thrive? How, how can that make a difference? What makes you thrive? What can that make? How can that make a difference? Understood? Does this make sense? Uh, it makes total sense. I think it's a wonderful question. And while you're answering this question, there is some time for Q&A with Josh. Hands up. Awesome, guys, and you can, first let me, before I, I don't, I really don't want to forget it because it's really important to me, my email address is joshuatetrick at gmail.com. I am pleading that if you're confused about anything, that you'll send me an email. It means a lot to me. I want to do anything I can to help you. The questions can be as specific as you want to be, like, I'm really interested in using mechanical engineering to make the world a better place. I'm confused about where do I where I start. I don't know anything about this do good for the world business stuff that you were shouting out about up there. Is there one website I can take a look at? Whatever the question is, bring it and we'll both be honest with one another about what you need to do to, to go after it. Did you have a hand up? Yeah. What's your name? Sure. Joshua Tetrick at gmail.com. Joshua T E T R I C K at gmail.com, Joshua Tetrick. You know, while I'm on, since you just asked me a question about email addresses, I always feel like obliged to say this. In terms of like getting jobs and internships in the world of, uh, you know, do good for the world business or socially innovative companies or organizations, never neglect the power of sending random emails to hundreds of people. Seriously. Even if you get ignored a hundred times, all the cool opportunities I've had in my life have been through finding these connections and sending lots of random emails in some cases. Um, and most of them don't get answered. 
but if you keep on pressing and being tenacious with those emails, and you also got to be a sleuth in, help, in finding those emails at some of these companies and organizations that you want to work with. So dig, Google search, find those emails, and it's really a good way to grab a hold of a lot of these opportunities. Give me some questions. Yeah. Hi, Josh. I'm just wondering, what's the most challenging moment of your career so far? What's, what's like the one moment you feel yeah. like you almost give up? What's your first name? Mandy. Mandy. I, between my first and second year of law school, I um, was working with the United Nations um, with an initiative where we would invest UN capital in the small and medium-sized companies that were doing some good. And I became a little bit disillusioned, Mandy, because my superior at the time wanted us to approve uh, a forty to $60,000 investment in a company that didn't deserve it in a company that by all objective measures wasn't being managed properly. They didn't do what they said they were gonna do and honestly I just felt like they were totally corrupt. Um, and my boss wanted that money to be approved because the United Nations accepts money from donor countries like Norway and Sweden in this particular case. And we needed to spend the money and get the money out the door or else we wouldn't get reauthorized for funds the following quarter. So sort of dealing with the reality of you know, life on the ground, working with an organization. Now, every agency of the United Nations isn't like that. It was one office. But sort of dealing with that tension and trying to decide who I am in that moment and what I want to do. And it ended up causing, frankly, a lot of drama in the office because I simply wasn't going to approve a forty to $60,000 investment in something that wasn't going to go anywhere. Um, and uh, it went to an ombudsperson, and people were on the edge of getting fired for it. So sort of dealing with that and feeling pulled in some ways by the selfishness of getting good recommendations from my superiors at the UN, you know, because those good recs are all important to us. But, you know, I think in that moment it's a little bit more important to me to, to live what I stand for as opposed to getting a good recommendation. So that probably would be, would probably be up there in the top three. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Patrick. Okay, so my first question is, can you please elaborate on how selfless, selflessness can be profitable? And my second to. question is, how can business-driven undergraduates thrive for a greater cause? How can selfless be, selflessness be profitable and how can business-driven undergrads, say the last part? Thrive for a greater cause. Well, let me just, do you mind if I relate it specifically to you? Yes. What, do you, what are you passionate about? Well, I have to be honest with you, when you were talking about um, your hallmates in the beginning trying to pocket an extra $100, I felt kind of guilty. You shouldn't. Don't feel guilty about it, because we can harness that. <laughs> we can harness that. Um, are you you're a business major? Um, I'm a hotel major, so yeah. Okay. When you think about where you would like to work, do you think you want to work at big consulting firms, investment banks? What, what do you think about? Um, I'm Just not exactly honest. sure. Not sure? But okay. So somewhere around there, okay. consulting, finance, real estate. Gotcha. I'm sure there are a lot of people just like that. Listen, there are so many opportunities. I would say there are two tracks. So these are the people that you know. You guys care about making some serious change. You want to work with big companies that are really profitable. I think there are two different paths you could take. The first is, or three different paths actually. The first path is, listen, a lot of the mega corporations out there are actually doing some good things. General Electric has an initiative called Eco Imagination. They invest in environmentally friendly technology, sun and wind, all around the world, and they're making lots of money doing it. Maybe you get a job with eco-imagination, right? Um, even Goldman Sachs, big investment bank, does it get any bigger and badder than Goldman Sachs? Well, they have an initiative called GS Sustain that focuses on investing in clean energy technologies and companies that are helping to forward a sustainable food system. There's a hedge fund, a hedge fund finance people that are all about, that's all about investing in good for the world companies because they think there's an alignment between doing good and making money. So that's one track. Another track you might want to think about is, listen, there are a lot of opportunities for you to start your own thing. I wasn't raised in a household that encouraged entrepreneurship. And I talk to my mom and dad about that sometimes, and I wish they wouldn't have always pushed me to work for other people. Because the idea of starting your own thing, whether that's a nonprofit or a for-profit that's doing good, is really exciting. So I would think about opportunities for you to start your own thing, too. Incidentally, a great startup book is called Art of the Start. Um, 
sort of the, the basics of starting your own thing, whether it's nonprofit or for profit, and to get a sense of more of the companies out there that are doing good, if you Google B Corporation, it's a certification that's given to companies that are using their business model to do good and simply being profitable businesses at the same time. So go to B Corporation, I think it's bcorporation.net. Um, engage yourself in this world of social entrepreneurship. There's a blog called socialedge.org. Um, Fast Company is a great magazine that identifies lots of companies that are also doing good. They talk about lots of different companies, but they have a cool focus on companies that are using innovation to do good at the same time. And seriously, like literally, just email me too, okay? All right. What else we got? I think there may be time for two more questions. Anybody? I'll be, I'll be super short. There. 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 <laughs> Get them. <laughs> no. Hey, Josh. That might have been the fastest I've ever seen a human being run. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, hey Josh. Sorry, um, hey. Uh, my question is, how do you thrive, personally? It's a great question, Zoe. You know, it was, as I said in the talk, you know, it was a long winding path to find that alignment between who I am and what the world needs. And I have to say, you know, when I note in my little book those times that I feel like I'm most alive, it would be now. It would be now. It'd be talking to young people. It'd be talking to lots of confused young people who don't really know what they want to do and finding ways to connect their soul and their heart to making the world a little bit better. And secondly, finding ways to start businesses like 33 Needs or um, other startups that are using business models, innovative business models to solve some big needs and talking with my team about it and selling the idea and being creative all around, creating those things. We got time for one more, right? One more. One more. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Josh. My name's Jeff. Jeff. Um, I think that uh, many of us would say that there's a lot of uncertainty that goes into taking one of these uh, non-traditional paths, um, you know, going to Africa and doing a lot of, of good for the world. but there's this huge unknown, you know, am I going to make money? Um, am I going to be in a safe place? And then on the other hand, you have, you know, these paths like finance where, uh, yeah, you're going to have to work hard, but there seems to be a, an outcome that you, you know is going to happen. What, what would you say to those people who might be deterred by that uncertainty? So I'm going to question one assumption you made. So in the end, you said something about finance. There's people that are interested in finance, right? Listen, guys. How many people are really interested in finance? You know, you're fine. Lots of people. Listen, I mean, there are so many opportunities for you to get involved with venture capital firms, with private equity firms, with big investment banks. JP Morgan has a social finance unit. Use finance. If you want to work with a traditional firm like Goldman Sachs or you want to work with sort of um, firms that are a little bit more out there, there's a firm called Grey Ghost Venture Partners that, in, that just invests in social ventures, just invests and good for the world companies. There's a great uh, venture capital firm called Mission Point Capital Partners. Even Kleiner Perkins, the biggest venture capital firm, one of the biggest in the world, is very focused on investing in these do good for the world companies. Again, not because they have a mushy heart, it's because they want to maximize their returns and often there's an alignment. But in terms of the uncertainty, listen, in life, you know, there's a little bit of risk, but I think the bigger risk, the bigger risk, is taking the path to a soul-sucking job. That's a bigger risk. Because ultimately, you're not going to do anything for yourself. Because you might think it's what you should do, and it might look good on the outside. But trust me, you're going to feel your soul being sucked away every single day. I promise. Lots of my friends I went to law school, law school with are experiencing that. And plus, man, we got too many needs to have a bright young man like you sitting on the sidelines when you can do some good and prosper at the same time. Last question. Oh, we get one more. Nice. I'm uh, a little embarrassed to admit that I'm very dense when it comes to investing. So I would just love if you could kind of explain briefly how 33 Needs works yeah. to someone who's lame with money, like Great. me. <laughs> so 
let's say someone has, uh, okay, let's say all you guys get together. And you're like, wow, this, this lecture series is really awesome. Like, we want to replicate this lecture series all around the country. But, you know, we want to be capitalists about it, and we want to charge for it. But we, we really want to focus on lectures that, just like this one, just like this series that focuses on social good, on social innovation. So all you guys could come together, write a little business plan, submit it to me and my team on 33 needs. We would review it, assess whether there's an alignment between the good you're trying to do, communicating an effective message, and the money you make. I mean, you want to charge getting this lecture, presumably. Uh, we would assess whether it's a good fit for us. If it is, you would tell us how much money you're looking to raise. Maybe you need 20K to get started. You'd have a little profile online at 33needs.com slash whatever we decide to name it. I can't think of a cool name right now. Um, and then anyone around the world could simply click the invest button and invest 10 bucks or 100 bucks or 50 bucks and they could be in Monrovia, Liberia or they could be in the corner up there. Um, and as you start generating money, they get a tiny percentage of the revenue that you generate. So it's, it's attempting to be a win for the investor and it's really a way of sort of building a connection with the people that want to support you, a deeper emotional connection and the good that you're trying to do. That might be a good idea. Don't steal that. I might take it. And with that suggestion, Josh Tetrick, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, my friend. Thank you. Thank you.